Hi, this week we move into some more explicit spatial methods and we'll talk about mapping and geovisualization. So basically what we're going to do is look at some principles on how to make good maps. I'm sure many of you have made maps before, but there's a big difference between good maps and bad maps. And cartography is a whole field devoted to the design and the principles behind map making and you can easily devote a whole quarter or even a whole year to cartography and cartographic design. Obviously I can't do that in this framework and what I just want to get across is some basic principles to make you start thinking about what to take into account when you make a map. So I have divided this in two sets of slides and this first set I'm first going to present some overarching concepts and situating where geovisualization and exploratory spatial data analysis are in an evolution from mapping from presentation to mapping to for analysis. And then uh, some basic ideas about what constitutes a good map, what are the elements to think about when making a map and particularly things like color and legends and scale and projections. Uh, again, just a primer in a nutshell, uh, what are some important points? And then I'll start covering the basic map classifications, how you turn the data into classifications that you use as basically colors for the map. So the second set of slides then goes into more specialized maps, what I call statistical maps. And some of these are very particular um, to Geoda. These are things I developed myself over time and actually found very useful. So um, we'll, we'll get to that next. So first of all, some terminology. And what is a map? And you never probably think about it. And there's many definitions out there. The one I like is by Mark Momenier, a, a noted cartographer, who calls it a collection of spatially defined objects. Now, a spatially defined object can be any number of different things. It could be what we saw last week, our fundamental geometric entities, points, lines, polygons, networks, but they could also be symbols and little churches and street intersections and things like that. So um, we're not going to be too concerned with the particulars of a traditional cartographic map design. But what we do want to do is to move beyond mapping. And uh, there is a big difference between using the map as a device in analysis versus using the map as the means to present the final results. And by and large, what we see in, say, standard data science, uh, lots of maps there, but they're typically used at the end to present the final results. And our approach here is very different. We don't really focus on that too much, but instead we use the map as something to interact with, to learn from, and again, in the same spirit as what I mentioned last week, in the process of knowledge discovery from data. So this is known under a number of different terms, geovisualization, um, lots of geographers use that term. Geospatial visual analytics is something you might see more in the computer science -y world. And then my favorite is exploratory spatial data analysis or ESDA. Okay, what are these things? So geovisualization, um, I would say a, a typical example is the work of uh, McEachran at Penn State um, in the GeoViz lab. Uh, creation and use of visual representations to facil facilitate thinking, understanding, and knowledge construction. So again, you see the same theme. You know, what are some, I like to call them devices, things that you design to make it easier for, for you to learn from the data. And so the components of geovisualization then um, in, in the view of McEachran are exploration, synthesis, presentation, and analysis. In this course, we'll focus on the exploration part. So then the geovisualization, as I mentioned, is mostly taken uh, up as a term by geographers. In the computer science world, 
uh, the term would be geospatial visual analytics. Actually, it's visual analytics. The geospatial is just kind of tacked on. And that um, is um, represented most vividly by the work by uh, Jim Thomas in, on visual analytics. And uh, he and his co-workers even um, trademarked a term, detect the expected and discover the unexpected. Uh, in other words, what they're trying to do in developing tools, methods, um, graphics, um, animations um, in visual analytics is um, to surprise you. So it's one thing when you look at the data um, to find what you already knew. And we saw an example of this uh, last week when we looked at the rents in Manhattan. And, you know, if you know anything about New York, you say, OK, sure, I knew that. Right. Even though I'm using this cool box map to discover it, I knew this already. Now, it's a different thing when you use a cool device and you discover something that you didn't know. And my favorite example of this is uh, several years ago, I worked with a number of criminologists on um, and we had just started developing Geoda and um, this whole interaction with the different graphics. Uh, and I was showing a relationship between homicides and an index of social deprivation. And in the literature, by and large, that is kind of an accepted fact. So I was sitting there with my colleagues in front of a big screen, and I was um, brushing through the data. And we'll talk later about how that actually works. And all of a sudden, so here was the regression line, classic regression line. All of a sudden, it fell flat. And that was the unexpected. Because basically, what turned out to be the case is that this relationship was an urban relationship. And when you move to rural areas, it didn't hold anymore. And they, you know, this is not something they expected. So that's what you want, you know, the light bulb going on. You'd see something that you didn't see before that you didn't know before. And so, of course, visual analytics actually came, a lot of that work came out of 9-11 where um, a lot of investment was made by the Department of Homeland Security to analyze data visually very efficiently because the human brain is actually very good at picking out patterns, sometimes the wrong patterns, but it's very efficient. So these techniques of uh, visual analytics were really designed to facilitate that. And then some geographers brought in um, spatial concerns um, and that's called geospatial visual analytics. So you have all these terms floating around. As I mentioned, my favorite term is exploratory spatial data analysis, which I defined several years ago as a collection of techniques to describe and visualize spatial distributions. So we start by just describing the distribution as a whole, identify atypical locations, so things that are different, spatial outliers, Discover patterns of spatial association, you know, later we'll call that clusters or hotspots, and suggest spatial regimes or other forms of spatial heterogeneity. Spatial regimes are an example of what I just um, uh, listed as an illustration. So if we look at the regression slope in one part of the map, it's like this, and in another part, it's like that those two parts would be called spatial regimes. And that's a form of spatial heterogeneity, which we'll be investigating in more detail. So that's ESDA or exploratory um, spatial data analysis. And so what's special about that? Traditionally, the way we think about discovering knowledge is uh, there are two traditional approaches. One starts from the theory or the hypothesis first, and then the data come later to support or falsify falsify the hypothesis. That's called a deductive approach. The other way is the other way around. You collect your data first, and then you learn from that and develop your hypotheses. That's an inductive approach. Now, in visual analytics and exploratory spatial data analysis, there's an alternative um, way to discovery, which is called the abductive approach. And where, so in deductive and inductive kind of go in opposite directions, 
in abductive, it goes together. So you discover the pattern together with the hypothesis. And it's kind of a back and forth between the two as you work through the data, as you interact with the data. And a, a term that is listed in the literature to characterize this is visual pop-out. It's the aha moment or the light bulb, as I called it before. So you're interacting with these maps and graphs and all of a sudden you see something that you didn't know before. And that's the moment, um, uh, the aha moment. What, how do we do this? And we'll see much more of that uh, this week and next week. Interactive mapping, meaning you don't just use the map as the final product, but you actually actively engage with the data and change the map as you learn more about the data. Animation, making things move, and then connecting different views of the data, as we'll see also later next week, uh, through linking and brushing. Okay. How do we make a good map? And as I said, there's many, many bad maps. And let me just start with two examples uh, to give you a sense of, of what may be going wrong. This is an example, it's a few years old now, um, where it shows two maps of foreclosures in Chicago. And so, as I think most people look at this map and say, wow, most of Chicago is being foreclosed upon. Well, actually, that's not the case. You know, in the map on the left, nine, or almost 9,800 uh, foreclosures. If you figure there's about 600,000 parcels in Chicago, roughly speaking, that's less than 2%. And even the next year, it's still a little over 2%. So there is no way that the red part on the map is 2% of the area of Chicago. Chicago is roughly 10 by 25 miles. So what's going on here? Well, we have a problem with scale. We have the scale of the city on the one hand, so the 10 by 25 miles has to be squished in to a few inches on the screen. But then we have the scale of the dots. And if every house is a dot, this dot actually, when you think about it, given that the 10 miles width is about maybe an inch or an inch and a half at most, you know, these dots, they, they're multiple blocks in the city. So that's a problem with dot maps. You know, you, you are limited by on a screen by the pixel size and on the on paper map by the size of the dot that you print. But as a result, you can uh, provide completely misleading information. And if you don't uh, think about this carefully, you know, you can, in, in this sense, create an impression like there's an overwhelming uh, degree of foreclosures. Now, granted, foreclosures were very serious, but not the way it is portrayed in, in the map. And then in another map that I actually just this morning noticed in the New York Times, um, it was a, a kind of an interesting study of the different hazards and how different counties in the U.S. were exposed by uh, two different hazards. But let's just focus on Fresno County, which is right here. This is Fresno County, right? And um, these dots, each dot represents a thousand people. And you say, oh, pretty reasonable. I mean, look at all the people in Fresno County. But look at Fresno County for real. Now, here's Fresno. So this whole part here, east, is wilderness. Wait a minute. This whole part east is wilderness. How many thousands of people live in the wilderness? Of course, this is just an artifact of the type of map that is being used. This is a this is one of my pet peeves. This is a terrible map. These dots are randomly put in the area of the state to represent the population of the state. But our brains are so conditioned that we start thinking, oh, that's where the people are. But it's not where the people are. The people are in the cities. They're in Fresno and a couple of other smaller cities. And then there's a little bit of a farm population. But out east, there's nobody. It's wilderness. So those are two examples of problems with maps. And there's a, if you have the time, I really recommend this. There's a, um, 
a nice little book actually I have it right here you know how to lie with maps I use it as a reading in my other course um, by Mark Mominier he came out with a new edition in 2018 and it really tells you um, all the I mean a whole range of things that could go wrong and that you really should be aware of and basically what his main message is that there are important map design parameters and unfortunately they can be manipulated so in other words you have to know what you're doing and if you know what you're doing you can give an impression that in a sense manipulates the user or the reader and these design parameters are scale symbols legends colors intervals and that the the main point is that human perception can be tricked and as i've mentioned a couple of times already i mean the human brain is really good at seeing patterns but can also easily be tricked in seeing the wrong patterns and a classic example of this you may have seen um, some examples of this is the choice of projection where you manipulate the areas so some areas can make see made to look bigger than they are and the classic example is Greenland where Greenland on many maps looks almost as big as Africa and there's no way that Greenland is that big so uh, we'll talk about this um, now a little more specifically so what are these building blocks first of all another pet peeve of mine it's a coral pleth map not chloral okay so don't ever say chloral pleth that is right away a dead giveaway that you really don't know what you're talking about just kidding what is a map it visualizes a spatial distribution so as i mentioned uh, last week too a, a, a critical characteristic of spatial analysis is the combination of location with data location with attributes as we say so a map shows that distribution how the attributes are distributed over space and often it shows them in a choropleth map for discrete spatial units so these are counties census tracts provinces things of that nature a couple of important uh, concepts and i here's another one that i could easily spend a whole course on uh, in fact there's a whole field dedicated to dealing with this it's the topic of geodesy and geodesy is basically about measuring the earth and um, a lot of people get confused about uh, people who haven't had training in cartography or geography get confused about projections and what this really does and so basically it's a two-step process and I'll talk a little bit more about in, in a few minutes but the first step is for of the process is that you have to have a model for the earth now the earth is not a perfect sphere it's not even an ellipsoid it's actually something a little more irregular which is called a geoid and so what you need to start off with is a mathematical model for the shape of the earth and that is called a datum and there's many datums over the years that have been uh, developed um, in the notebooks I give some specific uh, examples of this but basically this model is used to define every location on the three-dimensional earth in terms of degrees two kinds of degrees latitude and longitude um, latitude is the y-axis is vertical is north-south relative to the equator so the northern latitudes are positive degrees the southern latitudes are negative degrees from 0 to 90 and then longitude for some historical ac accident is measured uh, relative to the Greenwich meridian Greenwich is in, in London basically and east of the meridian going from 0 to 180 so going around is positive and west of the meridian going from 0 to 180 is negative since the US is in northern uh, north of the equator and um, west of London the latitude is positive and the longitude for US locations will be negative um, a second important aspect of a map is the scale and that's really how the length on the map 
matches the length in reality. And we already saw um, an example of this when I talked about the Chicago foreclosures. The width of Chicago is roughly 10 miles and the width on the map was roughly um, maybe an inch and a half. So an inch and a half corresponds to 10 miles. So the ratio of an inch and a half to 10 miles is called the scale of the map. And this is often confusing because a larger scale means that the denominator in this ratio is smaller. So if the denominator is smaller, say our inch and a half won't be 10 miles, but maybe only um, one mile. And that means there's more detail in the map and focus on small areas, whereas a small scale, so our one inch and a half over 10 miles is less detail and focuses on larger units. So this is often mixed up. People talk about scales as large or small, but they actually mean the opposite. Uh, my little trick to remember this is think of it as a ratio and not numerator denominator. The larger the denominator, the smaller the scale. Okay, projection. So I mentioned the first part is to have a model of the Earth, which represents everything in latitude and longitude degrees. The second part is to go from that three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional map on paper or on a screen. It's the same thing. So we have to do a mathematical transformation. This is actually quite complex and I won't go into too much detail. The main thing you have to remember is that there's no free lunch. So there is no way that you can keep all the properties of an object on a three-dimensional sphere or ellipsoid or geoid in a two-dimensional representation. It's like squaring the circle type of thing. So in practice, that means there's four important characteristics that cannot all be maintained. Angles or shape, area, distance, and direction. And this is important, you know, even though you may not want to think about it. If you um, are interested in showing, say, distance decay, you want to have a map that respects the relative distances between locations. If you're interested in densities, you want a map that respects the areas of the different um, spatial objects. So there's a number, I mean, there's actually hundreds of projections out there that have all different characteristics. Um, might be useful if you read to know what these things mean. Conformal projections preserve angles and more or less shape. Equal area preserve the area, that's important for density. Equidistance preserve the distance and azimuthal preserve direction. That's more for navigation. Uh, so a second set of parameters. So once we have figured out how to go from three dimensions to two dimensions, we basically have a representation, but then the map itself is really a model of reality and any model involves simplification. So we have to simplify the border lines. Um, you may have heard the story of how long is the shoreline of Ireland? Well, it all depends on how much detail you put in the map of the shore of Ireland and that will uh, affect the measure of the perimeter. So these kinds of decisions have to be made. We won't dwell on that. That's really pure cartography. What we will dwell on, or what I do want to spend a little bit of attention to, is some basic characteristics that you have to think about anytime you make a map for data. First one is the classification of the data. So basically, these, these maps, this core plath map, will simplify the distribution to a few categories, and each of these categories will have a, a color or a symbol or a shading. So we have to think about <clears throat> what is going on when we do this binning, when we do this simplifying of the continuous distribution. A second important aspect, um, and that has to do with human perception, is the color. And a third one is the legend. How do you actually associate values with symbols or with colors, if you wish, as well. These two are very interrelated. 
And um, in terms of re re representing value, we will only deal with maps that have discrete categories. So we have to turn a continuous distribution somehow into a smaller set of discrete categories. And, and that will um, involve choices about how large are the bins, how many bins, what are the cutoff points, things like that. There are some maps, especially uh, earlier on, that attempt to keep the continuity of the variables. Uh, this only works for very small data sets. For large data sets, there's no way you can do this. And so essentially what is done is you use a color ramp to go from light to dark to show the gradation of the um, values. But right there, there is a problem of perception. Colors are tricky to begin with, but also human eyes cannot necessarily see these sub subtle gradations in the color ramp. So you may not be able to tell the difference between two values that are actually fairly close together. There have been attempts in cartography to replace this by different cross hatching schemes, but these suffer from the same problem. If there's too many different values, you can't put the lines, uh, they become too close together and you can't tell the difference. Symbols are an alternative. Symbols are often a, a good solution because they abstract from the size of the area. We'll talk about that um, in the second half, or how that can be a problem. So none of these really work for large data sets. So we, I just want to mention them so you're aware of the fact that they exist, but we won't really be using these. Let me now get specific and talk about some really basic features of maps, colors. Very important, very tricky. Um, some people are colorblind, so they cannot see the difference between red and green, for example. Um, the colors also have emotional value. There's a perception of value. What is a good color? What is a bad color? Um, they affect the perception of pattern, especially if you are not good at distinguishing different kinds of colors. Um, by and large, reds are associated with heat and blues with cold. Red is also associated with danger. So you, uh, unless you want to project an association between a variable and uh, danger, you, you don't want to use red. You know, say if you want to show a map of crime, maybe you want to use red. If you want to show a map of poverty, you don't want to use red, right? So there is a website, there is this excellent website, colorbrewer2.org by Cynthia Brewer, a cartographer, who actually did, starting in her dissertation, a lot of work on the psychology of color and how you can use different color schemes to represent value. And uh, Geoda actually uses color brewer color schemes. And basically on this website, you have a whole range of choices. You pick your categories, the type of legend, I'll talk about that in a second, and the type of um, color scheme that you like, and then you get the exact codes for this color scheme that you can then uh, use in your maps. And we'll see in the lab how to do that with Geoda. So legends, there's basically three kinds of legends, and they have to do with the kind of variable that you're trying to represent. And um, first, we have a sequential legend. And what does that mean? It means the data are ordered. So there's low values and there's high values. Obviously, this doesn't work when your data are categories. It only works when there's a clear um, increase in the value of the data. And for uh, sequential legends, this is an, a screenshot of the Color Brewer site. You see how it works. You, you say what kind of um, you, you have the type of legend and then you have the color scheme and you say how many categories you want and so on. And then it gives you a choice of the code in which you want the different colors and then you can use that in your own programs or in your own maps. Second kind of a legend, which is we will actually be using quite a bit, is called a diverging legend. And you can think of it as starting in the middle and then moving out in both directions. So 
the moving out in both directions is actually different. So the emphasis is not on order as in a sequential legend, but it's on how you move away from the central part of the distribution. And so the associated colors then, um, here all these examples have white or light yellow in the middle. So this is the middle category. And then in this direction, you move out up. And in this direction, you move out down from the middle. So that's a diverging legend. And then the, the tricky one is a qualitative legend, really for categories. Why is it tricky? Because as I mentioned, colors tend to suggest value, but for categories, there is no value. All categories are equally plausible. There's no ordering, there's no high, there's no low. It's just A, B, or C, and A, B, or C can be completely interchanged. So it's actually quite tricky to come up with color schemes for categorical variables. And again, Color Brewer has some examples and we use these in Geoda as well. So those are the legends tightly uh, connected with the color. So we, we have some basic building blocks on how to make our map. We need to think about a datum. We need to think about a projection. We need to think about what colors we're going to use, what kind of variable it is that we're mapping. So what kind of legends do we new, use? Um, ultimately, we have to take the continuous distribution of a variable, say crime rate or income, and then DV this up in a number of discrete categories, pretty much like you do a histogram. So there are three, or there's many, but three very common map classifications. And they deal with the choice of intervals in a slightly different way. They select the cut points, which are the breaks between the different categories in slightly different ways. And as a result, they provide different impressions of the spatial distribution of the data. And that's something to keep in mind. So the three that I'll cover here, and then in the second batch of slides, I'll talk about some more statistical maps, are the quantile map, natural breaks map, and equal interval map. And of these three, my preferred one is the natural breaks one, and I'll, I'll uh, highlight why in a few minutes. So this quantile map is often the default, and it's not always such a great choice as, as we'll see in a second. So basically, um, a quantile is, is a, a fraction of a distribution. So a quartile divides the distribution into four parts. So you sort the data. The first 25% is the first quartile. From 25 to 50 is the second quartile. The 50 point is called the median. Then we have the third and the fourth quartile. So we basically take our distribution, sort the data, cut them in whatever quantiles we want. For four is a quartile, for five is a quintile, and, and so on. So the upshot is, of course, each group, each category should have exactly the same number of observations. We'll see one that doesn't work in a second. So, however, within this range, within this group, the range of values can be quite extreme. So one of the problems with converting a continuous distribution to a discrete one is that the implication, or at least the suggestion, is that all the values in the same category are the same. For a quantile map, that is not at all the case, typically. And so sometimes it can be somewhat misleading in that um, in you know some ranges have very little variability and all the values are pretty much the same. In other uh, quantiles, the range can be quite large. So that is something that we show in a box map, which we'll talk about next week. So uh, a problem, a practical problem with quantile maps is ties. And this is another example of the difference between regular analysis and spatial analysis. So let me illustrate. So here's a map of um, 55 subboroughs in New York City. And this is just the rent. We, we already saw this earlier as an example. 
And so basically, we um, take the rent, we sort it from low to high, and we take the um, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. So we have 55 observations. It doesn't quite neatly define a divide into four, but let's say we have about 14. We should have about 14 um, observation per quartile. Now, what's going on here? There's seven, there's 15, there's even 19 here. So something is not quite right. And that has to do with ties. So if we, um, and in the notebooks, you'll actually see this explained in more detail. If we look at the actual distribution of the rent, it's in this column here. So a quartile in standard non-spatial analysis or non-spatial statistics, we just take the 25% point. So we have 14 observations right here. We look at the value. The first quartile is 1,000. Fine. But if you're going to be, make a map, you have to put all the observations that have a value of 1,000 in the same group. Now, you have no way of choosing which of these should be in the first group. Should it be these or should it be these? You know, in a spatial analysis, that doesn't work. And that's a big difference with just the standard quartile is 1,000. But to group them spatially, you have to make a decision. And in Geoda, we make the decision that we bump all these ties up to the next level. So therefore, the first category only has seven observations, and then the next one gets bumped up. And this happens quite a bit in uh, quantile maps. So it's something to uh, look at. So, so quantile maps are very easy to make, but there's two drawbacks. One is that because each interval has the same number of observations, you do not control the range of the values in that interval, which can give kind of misleading impressions of homogeneity. And the second problem is a problem of ties. The natural breaks approach doesn't have that problem. It's really based on a clustering logic, very similar to, say, k-means, which is a clustering technique. The idea is to group observations together that are more similar to each other than they are to the other groups. And so this then results in breaks between groups that are very similar, and we call these natural breaks. So what are these natural breaks uh, classifications good at? Good at finding atypical observations. So whereas, so in our, in our example, um, if you recall, there's some weird stuff here. So these are three uh, neighborhoods that supposedly have zero rent. So this is obviously something wrong, missing value, coding error, who knows what it is. But in the quantile map, these are all grouped together with these other boroughs, which, which have legitimate median rents. In a natural breaks map, that's not going to happen because the clustering logic will say, oh, these three are all zero. That's very close together, whereas the next one is 800 or something. That doesn't belong together. So it puts this break in between these categories. And so, uh, as a result, unlike quantile map, the number of observations in each category can be quite different. However, the positive side to that is that you know, because of the algorithm and the logic behind the natural breaks, that these observations will tend to be uh, very similar. So you don't have this heterogeneity problem that you have for the quantile maps. So let's see what this looks like for our New York example. Uh, you might think it's, you know, it's very similar. We'll, I'll put them next to each other in a second. But look how these three, less than 800, these are the zeros. They are identified. And then the very high rents in Manhattan are also identified separately. And then we have kind of a low to median group with 33 observations and then a higher rent group with 13 observations. So that's natural breaks.
And then the last one is equal intervals. Equal intervals is kind of a histogram analogy. So you take the full range of the data, you decide how many bins you want, and the bins have the same width. So um, in a quantile map, you have four bins, but the bins have the equal number of observations, not the same range of values. Here, the bins have the same range of values, but then not the same number of observations. So uh, this is um, gets around this problem of heterogeneity somewhat, but not totally, because the cut points between the bins are to some extent arbitrary, because they're at equal distances. So um, here's the example, same example. Here's the histogram of the rents, and you see each of these bars, this one has three, this one 42, four, and six. The cut points are very different from the nat national, natural breaks, um, but we do see that you know these are kind of the first income range, the first median rent range goes up to 725, and so all the zeros are picked up by this one. This is equal intervals. So if we um, put the histogram next to the equal interval map, um, it's similar to what I uh, illustrated last week. On the left is a aspatial distribution. You have no idea where these observations are. However, if you link it to the map, then all of a sudden you see that they're all here in Manhattan, which uh, if you're not familiar with New York, should be an aha moment. What we talked about is like, oh, this is unexpected. Why should all these high rent locations be right next to each other, right? That's what we mean by finding the unexpected. Now, in this case, it's not really unexpected unless you know nothing about New York City. Okay, let's put these together to think a little more about the differences between these classifications. And this is uh, something you will have to assess in your second assignment, the exploratory assignment, where you have to assess, you know, what, what do you learn from the differences between these classifications? So very clearly here in the quantile map, we see the, the more or less even distribution of values, whereas in the natural breaks, a much clearer cutoff between the highs and the lows, and then two categories in the middle. In the equal intervals, because of the, the particular cut points used, see these are the cut points that are being used, they're all 725 apart, we get this huge second category where everything is kind of, everything that is between 725 and 1450 is lumped together in one category. So um, something to think, of, think about. Um, Making maps is not that simple. Actually, cartographers typically cringe when um, non-cartographers make maps. But what we've tried to do with Geoda is to build in some mechanisms so that at least you are kept from making the most atrocious maps and the most uh, common mistakes. But it's important to think about these fundamental building blocks, um, datum, projection, scale, color, um, map classification when you construct your maps. But keep in mind the way we will be using the maps is in an, an interactive fashion, not so much to present the end result. So the maps in Geoda are designed to make that easier, not necessarily to provide you with a nice finished cartographic product. product.